pictures that she has before they put her on it. <coughs> okay, yeah. Now we're talking about Blackie, my dog that had seizures, who somebody dropped off in the countryside. Right? You know how that is when you live in the country. I had pets every once in a while. I pity the poor person that dropped Blackie off because she was a wonderful dog. You know, ended up being... Anyway. She had a Thanksgiving day, her first seizure, and had one every hour for 24 hours. Okay, and that's good, yeah. Boom! Just like that. Nothing before, and then she would go blind, she would defecate, urinate, and I had to hold her, you know, because they will injure themselves. So for 24 hours, it was Thanksgiving, and there wasn't really an emergency. This was long enough ago, there wasn't an emergency vet clinic like there are now. So it's like I just stayed with her 24 hours. Every, tw every hour, about boom, you know, big seizures. So then we took her in, and then we got on phenobarbital. She was on probably phenobarbital for a couple, three years. And yeah, then, we get a lot of people that they think because their dog had one seizure and needs to be on medication, oh, yeah. they don't realize that it really can damage things internally if it's on long term. Every medicine is a poison. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you. I think isn't the recommendation for seizures if they have more than one a month, then maybe you put them on some. Yeah, meds. usually more than one a month or more than one in a day. If like yeah. if you have multiple cheated, oh, yeah. then yes. Yeah. But yeah, because I've got a relative that had one a dog that had one seizure a year ago. No, you're not going to do anything yeah, with that. Yeah, people freak out and like get really mad if we don't give them anything, and I'm like, you don't yeah. understand. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a it's a balance. Yeah. Okay, so good. We're, I'm, I'm ready to go now. So <clears throat> so what we're going to do today, and you guys are passing those things all around, right? They're, you're finding your exam. You got your exam, and I can pass those around because there's no grades on those, right? I mean, they're just your things you took last uh, Wednesday. And uh, we have the next test is March 1st, same room down in there. Hopefully Stella is available to do the proctoring again sure. on the exam day. She was such a good proctor. And uh, <clears throat> at the end of the hour, we'll probably let out a little early. I did alphabetize those, so when we let out, I'll do that alphabet alphabetically. And then... The key is over by the door over there. The key that's, you know, you can check your my my grading and all that stuff. So let me do a few things here on the uh, document cam. I've got this book, not that I can talk about it, but I'm gonna hand it back to Ethan because Ethan's gonna read this book. But I wanted to talk about the two authors there. I know those guys. Uh, Wilson Pond, very famous in swine nutrition. I'm not sure if he's still with us. You know what I mean. It's been a while. Harry, and I met these guys, uh, we intersected in Nebraska, University of Nebraska. Wilson Pond used to work at Cornell in swine nutrition. Then he was at the Meat Animal Research Center where I was at. Harry was from, I think, Baylor Medical School. And we all three were at Nebraska at the same time. We all were doing, uh, especially Harry and I, we were doing surgery on swine. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience with that. And then I'll hand the book back to Ethan. Uh, it was sweet working at this place in, it's in Clay Center, Nebraska. 35,000 acres of land that nobody can live on. And we had swine, sheep, and cattle. That's it. And we had cowboys. We would actually hire cowboys to work the cattle. <clears throat> and Harry and I, Harry had it better than me. He was a visiting scientist. So when he did surgery, Gene, our surgery tech, would do most of the work for him. He would just come in and do maybe something with a fetus or something that he was doing. But then she would sew up everything for him. I was a graduate student, so she didn't do as much for me, but I was learning too. So anyway, that's a neat book. I'm not sure if it's even in print. Hand that back to Ethan. He's going to make some quizzes on that. So now, let me tell you a little bit about exam one. <clears throat> and we're going to slow here because it's a Monday. Okay, exam number one. Somebody just took it at 1030 this morning. Taylor, where are you? I don't want to point you out. There's Taylor. And she was at a beef thing last 
week right in Nashville. I'm jealous. I asked her if she wanted a chaperone. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd make the best chaperone, but I mean, you know, a chaperone. <clears throat> and I think when you go on these trips, my philosophy is it's always a learning thing, right? So I didn't have any trouble with Taylor going to some place like that and we if you know me, if everybody takes a test at the same time, then you can get your test back and you get the key and you can have that immediate feedback. But there were enough people that were not going to be able to do that. And Taylor wasn't the only one. Uh, but I do think those are learning things. So if never hesitate, like, oh, I'm going to go and do something, but I'll miss the test. Well, we can work around that, right? But just understand that uh, then we probably keep the test and stuff. <clears throat> okay, so the average. Now, I haven't graded Taylor, so maybe she got 100, and we'll bump this up a little bit. You know. The average was 81, so that's pretty good. The range wasn't pretty, though. Okay, and you know, it's only one test, so you know, who knows. I, did you guys think taking the online quizzes helped you some? How many would say yes? Okay, so if you didn't do that, maybe that would help you next time. Although, yeah, and Ethan, now remember Ethan works for me too, he happens to be in this class. <coughs> He's working on a quiz as this, this month goes on, and we'll put it online. So, good. Uh, then, there were three people that got 100. That's pretty impressive, wouldn't you admit? Because, so, you know, those questions, you know, some of them were easy, some of them were not. Um, I think there were 15 people that had in the 90s. So, to me, if I'm looking at that, that's doable. It's not like the physics class, because what's the average in physics no, nowadays? Well, what is the average? 50s. 50s, okay. So, you know, I feel better. <laughs> 50s, okay, I'm not sure if that's right, if you should have a class. But that's why an A is a 75, a B is a 60, okay. and a C is a... Why not just make it doable? <coughs> yeah, why not make it doable? Well, because anyway. they want us to just have no self-esteem. Okay, like. okay. But here, I, and I, wanted, I want to show you the exam, because I want to show you how to study the old exam for the next exam. Why would I say that? Why should you study the old exam for the next exam? What's the rule I use? The 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule says that for any test, 80% of it is maybe from the most current material, but 20% can be from anything. So as we go along, there's more cumulative stuff. So let me show you a couple of things here. Because you should go back and you know, don't memorize answers. That's terrible. But I want to show you um, how to like make sentences out of these things. Now let me see if I can hone in here a little bit. Everybody's different. There we go. <clears throat> so, and my pointer. Okay, so let's look at a couple of these. Let's look at question number four. Come on. Okay, here it is. So this is the most toxic gas produced by silage. Now, if you know the right, what's the right answer? What is it? D, nitrogen dioxide. So here's the sentence you could put in your notes. Nitrogen dioxide is the most toxic gas produced by silage. So you could put that in a set of notes and learn from that. Okay. Now, these things, the one false statement, boy, that's tough. And let's see. Okay, let me put that over here. I didn't do a lot of those because, man, you, it, took, it takes a while. <clears throat> but if you can find the one false answer, then all the other ones are true, and you should write down those. So what's the false answer on that one? Anybody? Is it C? Yeah, okay. So this is false. Carbon dioxide home detectors need to be placed near the ceiling? No, because I plugged that one in the wall. Now it's on the floor, right? So then all these others are true. In antifreeze toxicosis, renal failure is directly related to glycolic acid. Radon emits 
alpha particles. And if you wrote those down and also set them at the same time, then you're learning. You know. Now, if, if you got the 100, maybe 100 points, maybe you don't need to do this stuff. But uh, otherwise, so whatever. Okay, so here's the other thing. I'm going to make a little videotape and go through them. And that's right. There you go. Thanks. Um, and then you can... I'll make other statements. But there's one question that I did want to go through, the half-life, okay? So let me go through the half-life one. Because I think enough people got that one wrong, and I know if you've had me in other classes, we always talk about half-life. But let me do an example. <clears throat> now, half-life, because we're going to end up getting to the pentabarbital thing, Pentabarbital, when you inject it into animal, has a half-life. And radioactivity has a half-life. Hormones made by an animal have a half-life. And the definition of a half-life is the time it takes for some quantity of drug, hormone, radioactivity to decrease by half. And then too many people think then if you had two half-lives, it all should be gone. That's a very common misconception. So I'm going to use an example of we're going to inject 400 milligrams. Oh, and the, some people got that picogram thing wrong, right? So go review that. 400 milligrams. <coughs> so I've got 400 milligrams I'm going to inject into an animal. And it's going to have an hour half-life. And I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four. I've got five hours showing there. So here's how it goes. You inject 400 grams of, let's say, pentobarbital into an animal. And we're going to look at that in a second. And after one hour, in my example, don't put, don't say pentobarbital has a half-life of one hour. I don't know right now. It's 200. So then, after one hour, there's 200 milligrams left, and you start that again. Then you go to half of that. So then you go to 100. See, I can do this mentally. <laughs> uh, and then 50, and then 25, and then 12.5, right? Sorry about that. That's how half-lives go, whether you're talking about hormones, drugs, <clears throat> or radioactivity. And then in the real world, I said that 10 half-lives equals gone. Okay, And you might say, well, theoretically, it's never gone, right? You keep dividing. but. And I think I use this example at Purdue when I used to have an endocrine lab and we had radioactive hormones and radioactive waste. If something had a half-life of 20 days, they would store it in some building. And after 200 days, they would throw it in the regular garbage. Why? Because it was essentially now not radioactive. Okay. So that's all I want to say on that. <clears throat> Let me... Okay, good. I need to, I want to talk about, uh, let's see, on my list here I had the exam, and then let's do pentobarbital now. So, hold on. Let me get this started here. Because it is troubling to find pentobarbital. Let's look at these two articles. They're, they're maybe not the best articles, but they're kind of a summary. Okay, so this company in Illinois that makes hunk of beef, anybody have ever feed that? I've never heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard it's of it either. So I don't know how 
uh, how many cans of this? They said. The troubling thing is, it was like noticed in early January. Where did that say that? Someplace up here. Uh, January 2nd. January 2nd. We have, there it is. <coughs> well, geez, it's February something now, right? What is it? February 6th. So that's a little troubling. <coughs> So then they found uh, one dog died and five became ill. And then they have this recall. Okay, and then there's the spelling if you don't know the spelling. Pentobarbital, right? That's very different than phenobarbital. So pentobarbital is found in this dog food. And so you got a question like, okay, what are they, where are they getting their ingredients to make dog food? And one thing, it's kind of like the melamine. Remember how the melamine was put in there? To get more money, basically, right, for your protein source. Yeah. I just looked it up really quick just to see because I didn't know what it, if it was like a dollar store food yeah. or anything. And it's like it's claiming to be like uh, grain, gluten free, no corn, wheat, or soy, made in fresh natural human grain, or made with fresh natural human grain <coughs> ingredients, <coughs> certified kosher for Passover. Um, I mean, are we talking about this dog food here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wow. So okay. And the ingredients for this specific one is just beef and its own juices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, and they do do say they, it was a beef source. Well, it looks like old Roy, so I thought it was like crappy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is supposed to be like really high quality. It's, it's it's super expensive. I think a case of it is like forty bucks. Okay, yeah. Here's the kicker, though, and you sh you, you can't be too naive. Naive. There's always unscrupulous people out there, right? That are going to try to make money no matter what you say. Uh, anybody, and maybe you guys don't remember, but there was some like McDonald's or Wendy's years ago that found out that there was kangaroo meat in their hamburgers. Anybody remember that? Yeah, there was kangaroo meat in the beef that they were serving at McDonald's or Wendy's, one of those places. So somebody's trying to make money, right? Because there's a lot of beef that comes from Australia. Okay, so then, here's the other thing. This was a local one. They're talking about, you know, the dog food and all those country, I mean, all those States, but the, I thought the interesting one was I looked up the uh, what you use pentobarbital pen sodium it's called, <coughs> and it's uh, for euthanasia in dogs. This bottle is, and oh yeah, and, and it gets me an idea. Make sure you understand that term. Euthanasia means good death, right? Literally, me and if you break it down, it means a good death. And unfortunately, there are times with our pets that we need to euthanize them, right? There's a certain time, in the, whether it's an injury, a disease, or old age, it's like, okay, the quality of life is gone. And there are some states in the United States that have euthanasia for people. If you've been, I think Washington State, I know, is one. I think Oregon. Oregon, there's, yeah. And, uh, and if you're diagnosed with terminal cancer and they give you six months to live, you can be you can decide when you're going, which is, you know, and there's other countries, I think Denmark does, Denmark does this all the time. So this is a drug, pentobarbital sodium, that's used, and there's always uh, one mil per 10 pounds of dog, <coughs> in this case. So dogs and cats and horses are pets, and a lot of times if they're euthanized, they're, you know, given some drug like this, but it's not very common in livestock. And so I want to get in, how do you euthanize livestock? You know, it's kind of like we're talking about this pentobarbital. So anyway, what, this is liquid, okay? Before we get to the euthanize, euthanasia of the big animals, <coughs> then I clicked on this bottle. No, let's see. It was on the bottom here. Anyway, there's another link, and I'll probably, oh, here it is. It also, I didn't realize this, it, came, it comes as a powder. And this is dog, cat, and horses. And I guess you would just dilute this up yourself. It's cheaper to ship it as a powder, it's and then, to ship too, yeah. and then you can. They, does anybody know? Do you uh, reconstitute it in saline or water? Does it sterile say? Water. What's that? Sterile water. Sterile water. Yeah. Okay. And so then you. In, so then this is for dogs, cats, and horses. Okay. But notice, not livestock, because here's a couple things. These animals don't get, well, okay, so aren't supposed to get in the food chain. Because if you euthanize anything with pentobarbital, it should not get in the food chain. 
And then that's this thing about this dog food. Okay, where do, how do you get pentobarbital? Obviously, a horse would take a lot. I mean, if that other bottle was one mil per 10 pounds, I mean, look at what you got there. Uh, and this would be IV, by the way. But if you're desperate, you do IP. What's IP? IP is not in the heart. Intraperitoneal, okay. Uh, because sometimes if an animal is very sick, you, it's hard to get a vein. See, I've never done that. I've always done either that or the heart. Yeah, and she makes a good point. That's intracardial yeah. administration, okay. And that's like an extreme form of IV, but yeah, I've done intracardial too. It's not, you know, unlike some rats, I think we were euthanizing. Yeah. Anyway, I have in the past used pentobarbital as a short-acting anesthetic to get like a big 500 pound bore down. All it is is an overdose of an anesthetic, that's all. Well, that's what this yeah. is, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that pentobarbital has been used for is lethal injections in prisons. And that's very controversial. Now the kicker is, if you've ever seen an animal euthanized with like, especially this pentobarbital, it's pretty fast if you do it right. And then you read in the newspaper where they have lethal injections for some prisoner and they talk about it was a half hour. You've seen those things. That's because they mixed it with oh, other stuff. Oh, yeah, works. there's other stuff they put. Yeah. But it's like when you read that and if you know this stuff works fast, you wonder what are they doing in the prison to take that thing, drag it out for a half hour. They give other muscle relaxants and stuff like that. But it's like that's scary when they're doing that. Okay, so pentobarbital. <clears throat> and uh, anybody have any questions on that? I'm going to put it on our links because it's going to be on the next test, pentobarbital versus. And make sure you know <laughs> phenobarbital is something else. Uh, that's usually tablets given per os. You guys know that term? That's two words, P-E-R and then O-S. What's per os? By the mouth, given per os. Yes? Um, they never came out and said where they thought the source of the contamination came from, did they? 